Bandwidth for Changelog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. We move fast and fix things here at Changelog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com, and we're hosted on Linode servers. Head to Linode.com slash Changelog. This episode is brought to you by Rollbar. Move fast and fix things. Resolve errors and minutes and deploy with confidence. Head to Rollbar.com slash Changelog. Request a demo. Get started today. It's loved by developers, trusted by enterprises, and most of all, we use it here at Changelog. Move fast and fix things with Rollbar. Once again, Rollbar.com slash Changelog. Welcome to JS Party, a weekly celebration of JavaScript and the web. Tune in live on Thursdays at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern at changelaw.com slash live. Join the community and Slack with us in real time during the shows at the changelaw.com slash community. Follow us on Twitter. We're at JS Party FM. And now on to the show. G'day, you are listening to JS Party, a weekly celebration of everything JavaScript. I'm Suze Hinton, I'm your host for this episode, and I'm joined by some awesome panelists as well. So this week we have a special guest joining us who I'll introduce in a little bit, but first, let's say hi to our regular panelists. So first up, we have Nick. What's up, Nick? Hey, how's it going? Good. Uh, and second, we have Alex on the panel also, who from his latest tweets I see was having fun with teaching parrot noises this week. Alex, what's up with that? Oh, um, <laughs> yeah, my, my son was... Uh you know, Mexican restaurant on Cinco de Mayo, uh, doing parrot noises, which are caca, caca, which also means poop in, in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was an interesting experience. All right. So without further ado, our guest this week joining us is Dylan Scheman. He is the CEO of SitePen and an open source technology innovator. Dylan is the co-creator of Dojo, uh, which is a popular JavaScript toolkit that revolutionized the way that we thought about building web interfaces. Uh, it's really, really great to have you on the show, Dylan, to talk about Dojo. Welcome. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. So Dojo was started by people such as yourself, Alex Russell, uh, David Schonsler, and others. Can you give us a brief history of how that came about since I think it was released in 2004? Is that right? Yeah, we started the project in 2004. Uh, prior to that, we had a another open source project called NetWindows. And um, Alex famously sent out an email, I think around April of 2004, saying, what would you want for my next generation DHTML toolkit? And uh, we had a mailing list and a number of people started responding and talking. And then a couple months later, Alex and myself and David started committing the first bits of code. And Roughly 2005 is when we first uh, shipped like a 0.1 release. But at the time, we were really just trying to say, hey, this JavaScript thing is pretty cool. We've, we're tired of reinventing things, and it would be nice if we could treat the web as a uh, you know, serious you know, application development environment, which at the time was fairly heretical. Was it a mailing list or it wasn't there like an old forum that doesn't exist anymore or something like that? Oh, well, prior to that, there was the WDF DOM forum yeah, that's, started that's by um, PPK or Peter Paul Koch, um, where we would discuss all the flaws of the DOM. And that started probably in maybe 2001. And um, a lot of the people there led to people who started working on Dojo. So yeah, it, it, it even goes back further than that. And uh, the name Dojo itself was suggested by Leonard Lin, who um, had a startup at the time, and we just had terrible luck with naming. I mean, we got a cease and desist back in 2004 from Microsoft, which is kind of funny because we're such TypeScript fans now. But um, at the time, because we had the word Windows and the name NetWindows, so um, we had to change the name on that. And so there's just a lot of good old history back then when things were quite different. So keeping in mind that there are folks who have entered the front-end development industry just recently or even just a few years ago, they might be missing context about things like browser incompatibilities and animation challenges and things. Could you give us a little bit more information about the kind of issues that Dojo was solving like pre-version 2 that are different to what other JavaScript libraries and frameworks are trying to solve nowadays? Yeah, I mean, you have to imagine this is a world where there was no GitHub there were two browsers, which were IE5 or 5.5 and um, early, early versions of Firefox. 
Safari hadn't been released yet or was about to be released. Chrome was still a few years away. GitHub didn't exist. Um, you know, almost all of the modern tooling that we take for granted wasn't there. Firebug had, had not been released yet. Um, so really, and ES3 was kind of your JavaScript standard. So in many ways, it was like writing software in the dark ages. Um, you, your goal was to make something work in, in both browsers because there was no mobile uh, web at the time. And, um, you know, the idea that you were going to take this platform that most people kind of laughed and shrugged off as something you you sort of treated as a dumb uh, view layer and that you were going to turn this into a real, you know, area where you would write applications was, was pretty crazy. And Alex and I and David were working at this company called Informatica. They're still around. And they had some pretty exceptional needs at the time. Uh, a lot of it would be vector graphics based stuff, large data sets, grids, charts, and, and all sorts of other advanced features that not only could you not do them with the native platform, but no one else even really tried at that time. So what kind of features in Dojo when it came out became immediately popular? So we were pretty heavily inspired by Flex and Laszlo's approach to widgets. And so we created probably the first uh, major component library in JavaScript, you know, ranging from form replacements to grids and charts to rich text editing and, and so on. And so most people, I think, you know, were attracted to Dojo because of its widget capabilities. Um, beyond that, we just had a lot of nice improvements to the language. I mean, Dojo 1 had something like 1,400 modules, so it was not a small framework at all. We had a build system. We had an early implementation of promises. We had... Um, various async patterns that you know are now taken for granted, but were not even conceived back then. Um, just you know, lots of things that made the development of things better. And you can see lots of these things have influenced the standards that we have today. So, for example, promises come from deferreds, which were an early concept um, contributed by Alex and another person named Mark Anderson in the Dojo project, as well as. Um, Another person who worked on a library called Mochi Kit at the time. Um, what else? Let's see. The you could say web components are heavily inspired by Digit. Um, the web's tried to get web components, you know, in place forever, um, but that's obviously been a big change. Uh, a lot of the ES5 features and ES6 features around, you know, just sort of um, array operators, bind, and and just other features like that didn't exist. And so libraries like Dojo popularized them. Even uh, like real-time stuff too, right? Socket D, uh, what was Dojo? Yeah, Dojo had an early WebSocket implementation and it had fallbacks to things like forever frame techniques and long polling and um, just because we needed real-time no matter what. And so we started a project uh, through the Dojo Foundation called Comet D that was basically one of the first open source real time client server communication protocols as well. I think that's why I initially ch got into Dojo a long time ago. Not that I was ever super involved with it, but I, I think that was like the only way you could get any of that done. And, and the documentation was good and it was I had the fallbacks and it was really cool right. to see real time. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these things we just take for granted now, but they were really difficult to do. I remember sitting at OSCON um, in Portland, I think, in a coffee shop with another engineer, and we were trying to figure out how to trick Safari into doing real-time uh, communications through an iframe, and it turned out what you had to do is, like, write to the DOM, like, one kilobyte of white space um, <laughs> intermittently, or else... Or else Safari would drop the frame connection after 30 seconds. So you would just randomly write white space junk. And then IE, I think you had to like write just any random character. So like, or maybe it was like four bytes of characters had to be written. And just these really strange hacks you had to get working until, you know, web sockets came to be. It's like a weird uh, front end no op, I guess, keeping something alive. That's funny. Uh, so Jared in the, the Slack chat says, curious why Dojo has remained so niche all these years, yet is always highly regarded by anyone who has experience with it. Uh, my short answer is I'm a better engineer than I am a marketer. Um, but, you know, really, the thing is, like, Dojo 1 was in many ways way ahead of its time. And so people who worked with things like jQuery and MooTools looked at us like we were just crazy. Like you guys are these like 
rocket scientists and I just need to be able to write some HTML with some light JavaScript. I think um, John Rezik once told me, and, and I took it as a compliment, I assume it was, that uh, Dojo was like the R&D center for the JavaScript ecosystem, that we would like invent stuff and then everyone else would you know, take good ideas from there and adapt them their own way. Uh, you know, my goal has never really been to say, hey, we want to own the web. Instead, it's we want to make a, a good influence on it and make it better, whether that's through using what we create or what others create that might be inspired by it. Niche is, is maybe uh, a bit harsh as far as Dojo's usage goes. It, it was pretty extensive uh, for a long time. I think before Dojo 2 in the last few years, certainly just like jQuery uh, and other frameworks are falling off, but like IBM and a, f- a few huge like enterprise level people who needed that uh, large set of documentation support and widgets were using it. So I I don't know. Um, it, it certainly wasn't jQuery level, but but it was pretty popular. At one point, we were used in over eighty percent of the Fortune five hundred. Um, it doesn't mean exclusively used; just that it was very widespread in its usage. So I got involved with Dojo probably around two thousand eleven. Uh, when I started working on it at a, a startup I was at, uh, or starting re- working with it. And uh, that was right around the time of the, the big uh, synchronous modules to AMD modules change that was happening. That was just a point release in the, um, in the dojo world. And um, can, you, can you talk about that a little bit? Like that, that seemed to be a really big turning point for, for the language. And of course, AMD got a lot of adoption uh, in other frameworks uh, as well. Yeah. Um, so James Burke was an early Dojo um, contributor when he was working at AOL. And then when he left to go to Mozilla, he found himself in a jQuery world and he wanted to bring the bits and pieces of Dojo that he liked to you know the broader ecosystem. And so um, between him and a few other people, the AMD specification kind of came to light. John Han and um, Roald Gill are probably the, the two others known at that time. I have a line in that spec, just FYI. Just oh, you one, did? One or, nice. few, one or two words are mine. Uh, yeah, that very awesome. important contributions. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and you know, the goal was to come up with a module format that worked asynchronously in browsers without needing a new language syntax, without needing a preprocessor to modify the code before it could run. Um, and so what happened is, uh, essentially around 2010 or 11, that was kind of standardized or finalized and Dojo 1.7 was the first, uh, version of Dojo that switched from a, a more synchronous, you know, Dojo.define, Dojo.require style syntax to an AMD structure. And it pretty much revolutionized the way Dojo worked. It improved performance significantly, especially in IE where it mattered most of the time, um, in hindsight, we probably should have called that Dojo 2 um, because so much changed at the time and pretty much it was a major refactor of the framework um, without really changing its capabilities at all. Uh, if I recall correctly, Dojo didn't actually use Require.js though. Didn't you all implement your own uh, loader? Yeah, um, you could use Require.js with Dojo 1, um, but the idea was we wanted multiple implementations. So Require.js was pretty much intended for the jQuery community um, the Dojo loader was also AMD compliant. Um, John Han and Brian Cavalier had another one. I'm forgetting the name, but they've done a Cujo, few as I well. Think. Yes, Cujo. There you go. Um, and the idea was we wanted multiple implementations because otherwise we wouldn't know if we actually had a good standard that solved different use cases. Dojo's been around for a while now. I'm actually interested just in the authorship side of things, and what has it been like maintaining something that is so popular for so long? I think if you look at the history of JavaScript libraries and framework authors, I'm probably the only one of the original bunch that still does this. Um, And I don't know why that is. I, I think it has a huge risk of burning people out. I mean, I think if you look at, you know, um, John working on jQuery or Sam working on Prototype or Valerio on Mutools or um, the founder of EXTJS, Jack Slocum and whatnot. There was a lot of burnout. A lot of people sort of, and part of this uh, philosophically is I think there are in general people that are really good at one of three things, starting something new and kind of hacking it together and getting it working. Sort of the second type of person is, once something is there and it's clear, really adding to it, 
And then there's the type of person that loves to maintain things to perfection and will be there until the lights are out. And it's pretty rare that you find one person that can sort of last through all three of those life cycles. Um, the joke among people I know is that I'm incredibly stubborn. So um, Dojo has lasted as long as it has because I won't let it die, which is, which is perhaps true, but perhaps kind of funny as well. Um, and that I, I'm not really one who's willing to like give up on something or, or let it go. I'm going to keep it going. And I have this real strong sense of duty to our users. If someone has taken the time to learn and adopt Dojo, I don't want to just say, oh, you know, I'm bored of that. We're going to shut it off and, and you can go figure something else out. So um, just kind of that sense of, of, you know, you've made the investment in us. We want to make that to you is what's really kept me going. Now, that said, like the the base of committers and contributors has changed drastically over the years. Almost no one who worked on the original Dojo, you know, 0.1 still works on Dojo today. Um, but I think that's okay. I think, you know, people's lives and perspectives change and their focus grows. I mean, Alex now is best known pretty much for trying to bring a lot of the goodness from Dojo one into the standards bodies, um, you know, through his work at Google. And um, so I think, you know, it's not so much about, hey, we need to all work on Dojo forever, but how can we make the biggest mark or positive influence on the web? That's really insightful. Nick, when did you come to start contributing to Dojo? So uh, in 2001, uh, 2011, uh, I was working on an app. Uh, my, my first big challenge with Dojo was converting a, a 1.4 uh, app to a 1.7 app, which meant completely changing over to AMD and learning that. Um, and I did that for a while at uh, this startup. The um, the CTO at that startup, John Christopher, he really um, was a big fan of Dojo. And uh, Dgrid was was this other project that's kind of a, a grid implementation that Dojo uh, th that's used in the Dojo ecosystem. And that uh, was a really powerful tool for for us in the app that we were building at the time. Uh, and then it was from that uh, Dgrid project that I actually became familiar with SitePen. Uh, and started looking to them uh, as my next um, my next adventure in my career, uh, and I, I've been there uh, pretty much ever since. Um, so for about five years now, contributing to Dojo One and uh, Dojo Two, and um, c teaching workshops and things like that. So I've I've been uh, really happy to be a part of this community, and and uh, um, I think that there's there's a lot of really cool ideas that have been improved upon. Uh, from Dojo One, uh, one thing in particular is like the the digit system um, with its declarative syntax for like creating widgets that you can use and and having a whole life cycle around that. Um, that seems like it's uh, an earlier implementation of of like what Dylan was saying, like web components or uh, maybe even like React components. I think that it's um, it could maybe be seen as like a building block to get to where we are today, which is really cool. Yeah, it's really interesting. So I mean. Um... The early data grid we had worked, you know, with real time stuff, but it also was one of the first implementations of a virtualized DOM in that it it supported virtual scrolling and virtualized rendering of of nodes. And if you sort of look at um, Dojo's grid plus Bespin, which later became the editor that's now part of Amazon, um, the Cloud Nine editor. Um, these were sort of the two early virtual DOM implementations that React was later, you know, crazy enough to say, we should just do this for the whole page of your application. Um, so there's, you know, a lot of cool inspiration there. But you know, if you think about it, data grids were kind of probably the reason people chose Dojo One was we had a really nice, robust data grid. And we've had one for many, many years. And in the enterprise, you know, every application kind of starts with the data grid. This episode is brought to you by the O'Reilly Fluent Conference. Make your plans now to attend Fluent in San Jose, California, June 11th through June 14th to learn the latest JavaScript tools and methods. Be part of what past attendees call, quote, a great center for modern web development and disruption and, quote, the best place to see the current state of the web. Use the discount code JSParty to save 20% on most passes. Learn how to build a better web with better user experiences at O'Reilly Fluent Conference. Head to fluentconf.com to learn more and register. All 
right, Dylan. Uh, I think we're going to talk a little bit about Dojo 2, um, but it actually kind of reminds me uh, of a uh, of a slogan that, that isn't anywhere near official, um, but wouldn't you say uh, that Dojo 2 is kind of a, a rehash of something that Dojo 1 already did? Um, and, and to that to that end, um, explain the uh, the the misnomer with the "Don't ask, don't tell," and uh, Dojo already did that. D A D T. So I think it was the first ever JS Conf, um, and Peter Higgins was there, and Pete's quite humorous. And pretty much any time anyone would talk about something, you know, he would quickly remind them that Dojo already did that. Um, and it kind of became the official meme of the first couple of JS comps that no matter what anyone presented on anything, you could say that Dojo had already done that. And, um, you know, it mostly I think we had a little bit of a chip on our shoulder and that we did do a lot of great things before others. And the ecosystem's not necessarily great at giving credit for, you know, where something comes from, but honestly, that doesn't really matter, but it's just kind of one of those things. Uh, but then, it was funny, just a couple of years ago, I finally met Adi Osmani in person after, you know, I think 10 years of talking online. And I show up to the, this was before he'd moved to San Francisco. So we're in the Google London office and he pulls out his printouts with the dojo already did that signs and took, we took photos with it, which was really humorous. So every once in a while, someone just kind of brings that up and gives me a good laugh. So Alex, you mentioned Dojo 2, and I'm really looking forward to talking about that on the show. So Dojo 2 was just released super recently at the beginning of this month. Is that right? That is correct. Yeah. So tell us about about this approach that, that you've had as a result of sort of bumping to a major new version. Yeah. Really, the thrust of working on Dojo 2 has been over the past year and a half or two years. But I think I first started talking about the idea of Dojo 2 at a conference in 2010. So it's been many years in the planning. And in many ways, it's kind of like when you're uh, a musician and you've had your first successful album and it's really awesome. And then you don't know what you should do next. And what we realized were a few things. One, Whatever we create, we have to support for a long time. Two, we um, want something to be appreciably better than what we've created before, as well as something that is strong on its own, so not just you know a rehash of what other people are doing, and something that you know is very modern and, and forward thinking. And around 2014, we thought we were on a good path, and then we saw that ES6 was finally going to land. And we had also started to take a strong interest in TypeScript. So we pretty much scrapped everything we were doing, took a step back and said, okay, if we were to start a new framework today, what would we build and how would we build it? And then we took a few years to iterate on that. And we ended up with something that is sort of core to our, our beliefs with Dojo, which is that we want to you know, provide a very solid foundation for the enterprise. We want something that's going to scale up or scale down that but we're really aligned with the ecosystem. Whereas Dojo 1 kind of had to build everything in a silo. Dojo 2 can say, you know what? Everyone uses Webpack. Let's make this work nicely with Webpack instead of creating our own build system. Um, we did make a huge bet on TypeScript. So Dojo, while you know frameworks like Angular use TypeScript, Dojo 2 is pretty much designed assuming that you are a TypeScript engineer, which is a pretty radical departure from what we had done before. As far as the ergonomics of of using Dojo two versus Dojo one, is it still a similar? Like there are digits and there are um, these things. At, like I assume it's become more declarative uh, in like a more virtual dummy kind of way. All these types of things uh, have been adopted. Um, what what are the main impacts of like day to day like application development uh, in Dojo two versus Dojo one? So Dojo 1 was really its own thing. Um, you know, we had our own module system, our own class-like system, our own widget system, and so on. Uh, and part of that was because, you know, back in the day, the standards process was not great. Um, it was more black box, you know, things would get thrown over the wall to you as opposed to today, where it's very much aligned with the ecosystem and there's a lot of open participation. So Dojo 2 is much different in that... It's very focused with standards and, and common patterns. So, um, yes, we have a widget system, but it's also built on a virtual DOM engine, uh, one that we had originally started with using maquette, but that we forked um, so we could get a bit more control over how we render widgets. 
Um, it's, you know, it uses ES modules. We use TypeScript. Uh, we have a number of core uh, features. Um, but the, it's kind of, in many ways, what we've tried to do is give you the flexibility of something like React where, you know, you, you kind of have all of these nice smaller pieces. But take advantage of the fact that we want a set of things that work together, um, you know, in not quite as much as, say, Ember takes where you've got everything designed only to work together. But, um, you know, the idea is like you've got all these small pieces, like a good routing implementation and a good widget library and a good system for uh, reactive components and so on. But we want them to be able to take advantage of actually being built together consistently and coherently. I hear that. Uh, I think at any given time uh, at work, we're upgrading 10 dependencies in order to be able to upgrade <laughs> two dependencies in order to be able to upgrade one dependency. Uh-huh. Yeah. So SitePen, you know, the commercial side of what I do, we do a lot of consulting work, whether it's with Dojo or React or Angular or whatever. And we kind of know the pain points of working with various um, frameworks and solutions. And so it, it kind of frames our reference on, okay, what would I do if, if it was just up to me? I'd create something where these pieces work together and it's not quite as painful to get started or to upgrade. We've also done a lot of... Um, fairly forward thinking stuff. So uh, for example, one area where the virtual DOM paradigm kind of breaks down at times is when you're working with something and you, in general, you just need to know something about that particular DOM node. And so the, the typical way is to say, all right, I'm going to punt on the virtual DOM here. Just give me access to the node. And that might be for animating an object, changing its dimensions, setting a focus event on it, or some of the newer APIs like intersection observers and resize observers. And so what we've done is we've provided this pattern called a meta. And what it does is instead of you having to get the DOM node, we provide the properties for those common scenarios so that you can still work with those um, behaviors in a reactive you know, manner. Um, so what makes Dojo 2 pretty interesting to me is we've looked at the like hundreds or thousands of little tiny minor pain points or inconsistencies like that and really tried to refine them and clean them up and make them feel more consistent. Yeah, I think that that's one of the biggest um, uh, focus points for Dojo 2 is, is really a focus on making things easier for the developer that's using it. So a big focus on developer ergonomics uh, with things like that in the meta project uh, and and other things you mentioned uh, that we write in TypeScript, uh, and we we assume that the users are TypeScript users as well. We also um, write all of our modules with uh, TypeScript strict type checking turned all the way on, so that uh, it's keeping us honest and it's making for the best possible experience for the users of the the framework. Yeah, the TypeScript team jokes that we're stricter than they are because um, they're not fully strict in their own authoring of TypeScript itself. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> doesn't that uh, leak down into your strictness, though? No, no, I'm I'm mostly just kidding. Um, I mean, they're they're very good engineers, but there's just a few places where they can't be fully strict. But we are, um, and it is a little more painful. But the goal is to make it so our end users don't have to suffer for us not getting things just right. When when you talk about them not being strict, it, it's in like their own parser. It's in their I guess I'm confused how how if you're checking with their parser and they're not strict, it seems like it would uh, follow that you had the same. No, I, I, I think I guess I'm confused. It's a very meta problem, but I mean, so uh, TypeScript itself is you know like most languages are authored in their own language, so um, it's one of those interesting meta problems. I just mean that parts of the TypeScript compiler itself are not strictly are not you know completely strict, and that's okay. Um, but for us. It's a you know a badge of honor to say we're fully strict and that we're going to catch every possible mistake that you might make that the you know the compiler can enforce. So I was taking a look at the Dojo Two website um, and just having a look at the impression, the first impression of what is important to you as an author of Dojo and the Dojo community in general. And one thing that popped out to me that I found unique compared to other modern frameworks is the word inclusiveness. And one of my personal passions is accessibility. So I was really, really excited to see that that had been brought to the top right on the front page. And it talked about how 
uh, internationalization and accessibility is built into Dojo and the support of that. So in my experience working with other frameworks, I've seen accessibility teams um, spin up from the community in order to sort of address some shortcomings for accessibility in other frameworks. That is clearly not a thing for Dojo 2. So can you just tell me a little bit about how internationalization and accessibility became a priority when you were uh, authoring and releasing it? Sure. Uh, so for Dojo 1, we were the first... Okay, so back you know, back in like 2005 or 2006, we were at the first Ajax Experience Conference. And we were on a panel, and the question that people kept asking about all this new Ajax stuff was, but is it accessible? And everyone just kind of had hung, you know, hung their heads in shame and said, no, that's an area that's ripe for innovation. And IBM got involved at a very early stage shortly thereafter, and Becky Gibson and her team um, were part of the ARIA effort and part of making Dojo the first library that supported that standard. And so for us, it's just been something we've done forever. And in parallel, we also support internationalization back then too. Um, so, you know, stepping forward, that's something we're known for is we take, um, you know, the idea we want what you create to work for all of your users. And so that might mean, you know, like ranging, you know, ranging from blindness to foreign languages to um, just having better keyboard shortcuts, you know, the full range of how do you provide a better experience for all of your users? And so fundamentally for us, internationalization is a fairly different beast than accessibility. Internationalization, we leveraged a JS Foundation project called Globalize and then provided that in a modern reactive manner. So basically all of your out-of-the-box components that you might author, you can easily hook them into an internationalization system and get all the nice things that messageformat.js and, and Globalize give you. Accessibility is about a few things. Um, it's about you know, first of all, the components or widgets that we create are accessible out of the box. They, you know, comply and conform to the best standards that are out there um, and that we've gone through and done that. And Sarah Higley leads our efforts um, on Dojo 2 around accessibility. And then it's about providing good guidance. So, you know, good documentation information about how we do that so that engineers don't just turn around and break accessibility in, in their own efforts. And then we do also provide some automated testing for the things you can automate. Obviously, you cannot automate everything around accessibility, but there's a few good tools. There's Axe and there's Tenon and a few others. And our intern testing tool hooks into those to basically say, hey, these are mistakes that you might make that could break accessibility. You can automatically test for them in your code base and at least be notified, hey, this first pass of stuff that you could do to break accessibility, you shouldn't ever do because the tests will tell you otherwise. Why do you think that other JavaScript um, frameworks or libraries have not really tried to have this built in from day one? I think um, to be nice, but maybe not nice, I mean, a lot of people are impatient and they just want to get things out the door. Um, obviously, that's not us, given how many years it, it really took us to feel like we got Dojo 2, right? And, you know, we still don't feel like it's perfect, but we feel like it it's solid enough that we can, you know, stand behind it. Uh, but I think it, in, in general, people just aren't patient enough to say, hey, I'm going to solve all of these problems as perfectly as I can before I'm going to thrust them on people. Um, and so I think it's, you know, I'm, I've been around the ecosystem long enough that I know that I don't have to, you know, push something out first. I don't have to race to get it done and sacrifice, you know, the things that matter. I think it partially comes from the philosophy of the, the Dojo team of making a bunch of tools that work together. I do agree with the like the idea that a virtual DOM implementation or, or a component implementation uh, can be separated out and tested separately from a message format implementation or a internationalized component implementation. And so splitting those out all seems good um, as far as code goes. Um, so the fact that Dojo already ships everything, all that works together, kind of makes sense that, that they might uh, have all these tools that, that work together. 
versus uh, someone who's like, all right. Like when React came out, I, I remember being very underwhelmed. It, like this looks cool. Uh, it looks fast for the view layer or the render function of the view layer that I already have in my massive application, right? It, it just did this one very small thing. Um, and, and everyone just kind of piecemeal put their own, you know, for, for the first six months of React, everyone was just adding it to their backbone applications as as the view layer. So I think it is a different approach for sure. <laughs> yeah, no, it's definitely a bit more holistic. Um, I mean, I think in general, accessibility is still challenging even for HTML type work, um, and which makes it a bit more abstract for virtual DOM systems. I mean, I think there's a lot of promise and potential with the accessibility model or the AOM accessibility object model, uh, stuff that's being done that, you know, could potentially make this work a lot uh, more smoothly. Um, so that's pretty promising as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think if you're designing systems that work well together, you're less likely to introduce things that break, uh, you know, your approach. Uh, you know, there's the classic example of, hey, I've pulled 20 widgets from 20 different, you know, places, and I don't know if all of them are going to be accessible. Whereas if you release a set of widgets together and you've tested them all for accessibility, um, you know, you can make the promise that, hey, we've, we may not be perfect, but we've put serious effort into thinking through these problems and done our best to, to do that. And then, you know, accepting fixes and releasing them quickly where we fail. What kind of things do you think would help with that fragmentation issue that you just mentioned about, well, Dojo is a collection of things that were worked on and they were made to be consistent. When you have um, a, a whole community making lots of different types of components, such as, you know, um, when you can just npm install a react component for example or a view component or an ember component how do you think that we could convince the community to be more mindful of these things like how do we sort of stop that fragmentation of the the different i guess gaps that we see as far as accessibility goes one of the challenges we've had as an ecosystem is what I describe as the GitHub effect and GitHub obviously is one of the most amazing things to happen ever to software engineering, but it's also a bit of a curse in that before GitHub, it was actually a challenge to start an open source project. It required effort in actually setting up a project and setting up source control. And today it's so easy. You just, you know, create a URL and, and go to it and start a project. And what it's done is it's reduced the barrier to entry of creating your own framework rather than the effort to contributing to someone else's. And so there's a lot of value in getting people to actually work together and collaborate on things that gets lost when everyone just kind of does their own thing in their own way. And obviously there's there's a use for both, right? Because you need innovation and, and creativity, and that only happens when people try and experiment and fail and eventually find a nice path forward. But you really do need people to decide, hey, it's worth the effort to get together and collaborate and come up with something that works together and is consistent and has some common standards and guidelines. And it's, you know, it's both end user accessibility, but it's also developer accessibility, right? If I have to learn slightly different APIs for each component I'm using, that's tedious and that's, you know, reducing my own experience from getting my work done. Um, so there's just a lot of uh, need to get people to collaborate and communicate and decide that is a challenge. Um, and it's one of the things I feel like Dojo was quite good at early on. Um, and But I think every project struggles with this. And I don't know if I have a good answer for it so much as if you're aware that the problem is probably human um, communication, you know, you can maybe look at yourself and say, how can I make this better? It, it also seems like the projects like React like doesn't need to be building necessarily the internationalization layers of the accessibility uh, like rules since they're not releasing their own their own widgets but it seems like they could release a set of standards of like here's how we would expect this to be and here's like this certification process not like a real one but just like here's a thing you can run your thing through if you run it through this we'll check for the following things and then you can add this badge to your github page and like generally just like implying via docs and 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 words like what would be expected it seems like it would go a really long way for for a lot of uh at least the the most popular widgets to just like might as people you know would pr that i don't know i think we, there's a lot we could do 
even in the current fragmented system to to standardize more on what's expected for internationalization and accessibility. So speaking of components, let's talk about Dojo 2's widgets. So um, I, I saw in my research that they're designed to be adaptable as like new open web standards are introduced um, and they're supposed to be just more forward thinking than components of past. Like how do you ensure that going forward and and how do you design these different widgets to be adaptable? So we've taken a few interesting approaches. Um, The first is everything in Dojo 2 is easily imported or exported as a web component. And that's just how it works out of the box. So it's not that Dojo 2 widgets have to be used as web components, but that they easily can be. So, um, and as well as being able to pull in web components from elsewhere. And obviously, this is just the custom elements portion of the web component spec. But we think that's really important because if you can reduce the barrier uh, of entry between frameworks with regards to how components are authored and used, that's really useful. It also is a standard way to say I'm I'm registering a custom tag that has um, these properties and these attributes and this behavior. Now, web components aren't perfect. There's a um, challenge in sort of cross-component communication, cross-component data sharing. Um, you know, they're really designed to kind of be standalone. But you, know, you take advantage of the standard that's there, and then you figure out how to augment it where you can. Um, so that, that's kind of the foundational piece. Then what we've done on the styling of components is we've said, instead of really focusing on the sort of preprocessor ecosystem that's been in place, Let's look at CSS next and use a library called PostCSS. And what it is, is it's sort of like Babel is to JavaScript, it is to CSS. So it takes the sort of emerging CSS standards and back compiles them to CSS that works today. And the idea is to really get people aligning the way they author their CSS with the standards that are coming out or that are emerging, rather than you know sort of you know jumping into this alternate ecosystem that is useful, but you know, not necessarily aligned with where the web is going. And then really just looking for features that solve problems that people have had with components over the years. So uh, my favorite is probably the Intersection Observer API. And this is kind of has two main use cases. One is this sort of infinite scrolling challenge, you know, your Facebook feed or your Twitter feed or whatever. Um, and what it does is it basically determines if something is in the view of something else. And then uh, the other use case for it is potentially data grids or things where you've got large lists and you need to scroll them. And that is potentially a much better way of solving this problem that we've had to solve through large, large blocks of JavaScript code to handle all the use cases that might be possible. So we just kind of keep following uh, the WICG list, the um, TC39 efforts, what WG, and kind of look for things that feel like they're going to make the web ecosystem better, especially for how HTML, CSS, and JavaScript interact together, and then roll them up and, and keep iterating on that. Um, we also look for things we can do that make the authoring experience better. Uh, for example, we have this system that uses uh, CSS modules and TypeScript together so that when you're applying a class name to a component, it can only you can only, as an author, create valid TypeScript if you include a CSS class name that was part of that component's CSS file. And we do that by just importing a TypeScript definition file that is automatically created from each CSS um, file that's related to each component. So, for example, if I'm in my Hello World widget, I've got a list of CSS class names that can be auto-completed as it's time to style them in my JavaScript code. And that might sound like a small thing, but it's just one of those things that saves you five or 10 seconds every time you need to figure out which class name to apply to a component because your IDE is going to sort of lock you into that list of ones that you've scoped in the context of that component. Um, So really just kind of looking at how all these pieces fit together, where we feel things are going, um, and just kind of trying to keep that direction going where the web is going in general. Hey everyone, I'm Tim Smith, senior producer here at Changelog. You know how important it is to stay in the know. And our weekly newsletter helps you and thousands of other developers do exactly that. It's the developer news that matters, nothing more and nothing less. Visit changelog.com and subscribe today. (laughs) 
So for our last segment today, Alex was going to start chatting with Dylan about web standards and foundations, and he just had a few questions for Dylan around that. Yeah. So Dylan, you have been involved in much more than Dojo um, in the past, specifically around standard stuff. Um, one such interaction that I had with you uh, is detailed in a, in a talk that I gave around uh, CSS colors. Um, <laughs> I, I, w I was excited to find out while I was researching the history of CSS color names that Dylan had many of the same questions that I had uh, doing that research. And unfortunately, he had asked them 11 years prior <laughs> and never got an answer. Uh, and so I, I eventually found that information and, and replied to the, the WWW-style mailing list. But that was in 2001 when CSS3 was being uh, kind of ratified. I, I hadn't realized that you had also been, you know, that deep into standards that long ago. Like 2001 is, is pre-Dojo, yes? Oh, yeah, definitely yeah. a few years so, before. So you were involved in, in the that mailing list i mean for years prior to, prior to that i guess if you, you you had even like compiled all the different places that other people were confused about css color names uh and linked them in in your very informative post um so so tell me a little bit about your uh standards history as well sure i think it was around 96 when i first really got into javascript so i mean pretty early in the days <laughs> and um, I had read most of the books that were out at the time, and honestly, there weren't a lot of other resources available yet about JavaScript. So I started joining the various standards mailing lists, which at the time were the style list, the DOM list, and um, the JavaScript list, and really just started participating. And I felt like the best way to understand the web platform as a whole was to um, you know, participate in the standards process. So at the time, frankly, it was a bit unless you were paying to join the standards body, you really didn't have a say, but you could still participate and, and figure things out and ask questions. And, um, you know, standards was mostly a part-time job for a few engineers, each of the browser vendors at the time. Um, but it was really fascinating to me to, to say, okay, how does this really work? And one of the first things we did at SitePen is we tried to create something sort of like Google page create. Um, so basically a web-based uh, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript editor, but this was back in 2000, so it was a little different than trying to do it in 2010 or something. And one of the things I wanted to do was to figure out how to make it easier for um, you know someone who had no programming experience try to style a page, which led me down the color name path. Um, so it was, I actually had proposed an alternative way to name colors at the time, and there were a lot of cool th ideas that didn't go anywhere, but were still interesting to think about. Um, and today, I mean, standards are amazing um, compared to back then. I mean, they're not perfect, but the you know the open process, the th way we handle things on GitHub and talk through them publicly, and um, you know the growth of TC39 and what WG. I mean, Ian Hickson probably deserves the biggest amount of credit for sort of changing the way we think about the standardization process as a whole. So you know, in the early Dojo One days, I kind of had the feeling of. Standards are broken. We'll just do whatever we want. But today, standards feel pretty good. So we try to align to them much more closely. Around the, the same time Dojo uh, was released, I guess uh, um, a little while after, but I know I've, I've talked to Alex uh, Russell a little bit about this in the past, but you guys were felt pretty strongly uh, about um, code rights and uh, licenses and things like that to, to the extent where you created a very hands-off uh, but uh, like protective entity, um, which was I think one of the first like f foundations that that I had known of. Like the, obviously there's like Apache, uh, but it was like pretty 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 early on. So tell me about the history of the the Dojo Foundation. Yeah, so after getting that, Alex got that cease and desist over the name Net Windows. It was pretty clear that we did not want to be, you know, the legal entity for a framework. So we talked with some friends. We knew Martin um, Cooper who um, was working, he was the vice president of the Apache Software Foundation. Uh, we knew the president of the Python Software Foundation. And we just kind of asked them a lot of questions and realized it wouldn't be that difficult to start a foundation. So we did, um, that was focused on JavaScript. At the time, it was called the Dojo Foundation because we weren't particularly clever with naming things. And for us, it was a really big, important point, which was that the code that's there 
people can use. They can trust it's not going to be pulled out away from them. The licensing's not going to change on them. Um, we, you know, we said we're not creating fake free open source software, and this was a pretty big deal at the time. Um, but that, and also, one company doesn't really control the destiny of a project. Um, you know, and, and the, the idea was to reduce the barrier to entry for other organizations to contribute and get involved. And I think the foundation is what led early on to companies like AOL and IBM and Esri and um, Sun and, and others at the time to say, we can contribute to this because you've sort of gone through the effort to make sure that we're not basically contributing to some other company's IP, but instead we're contributing to this shared ecosystem. I think that still ends up being an issue today. Like a lot of the the fear, uncertainty, and doubt around React has to do with clauses in Facebook's ownership of that code. There was there was also a few other foundations that submerged. Uh, give me that history as well. So yeah, so over the years, Dojo had taken on a number of other projects, including one of yours, and then the jQuery Foundation was founded, and it had jQuery and um, some other projects. And then I think about three years ago, um, Colin Snover introduced Chris and, and me, Chris Borchers being the president or the director of the jQuery Foundation and said, you know, it'd probably be simpler if we just had one foundation that we could manage and take care of instead of two, um, especially since a lot of the projects had strong overlap. So we had RequireJS and Lodash, which were quite popular in the jQuery community and, and vice versa. So we uh, merged and then sort of rebranded and relaunched as the JS Foundation about two years ago. Um, and it's basically the idea is it's it's a home that provides support and protection for projects. Um, the idea is not to sort of fund development of projects that, that kind of gets into some uh, legal gray area around is this an open source foundation or is this, you know, a contractor in the middle. Uh, but instead, it's really just focused on providing the support for open source projects around community and legal rights and, you know, um, support that frankly, most open source committers are not really good at or don't want to think about. So it just kind of gives them the support they need around those areas. Um, you know, my hope has always been that the foundation would encourage projects to collaborate more instead of, you know, reinventing the wheel. And so, for example, with Dojo 2, we leverage um, the Pointer Events Polyfill, which is a JS Foundation project. We leverage Globalize, which is another project. We leverage Intern, which is the testing framework that's part of the foundation. And we also use parts of Grunt for our development tooling. Um, so the idea is really not to say, hey, all these projects should become the same. But if, they're, if they have clear you know, boundaries and API approaches, can they be used together in a nice way? As far as like if, if I'm a person who maintains an open source library that's not huge, but you know, a lot of people use my calendar implementation or my something implementation, where, what do you suggest they do as far as uh, licensing? Like, obviously, like there are very specific licenses they could choose, but as far as like foundation stuff, how do they m manage the same um, like minefield? I mean, it's a challenge because one of the goals of the foundation is not to become the graveyard for abandoned or, you know, ugly toys anymore, right? So it wants to have projects that are thriving and, and well-supported. Um, so, you know, if you're a really small project, it's hard to say, hey, I want to join the foundation. Um, but, you know, it might make sense to join a project that's part of a foundation sort of thing. Um, licensing is is one of those things that everyone has an opinion on, but really there are two types of licenses. There's those that are permissive and those that are a bit more control oriented and they both have their purposes. So for example, Linux is, you know, the champion of the GPL style license. And, um, I think it really needs to be. And then most JavaScript libraries or frameworks are more along the lines of either MIT, Apache or BSD licensed, which are all roughly the same. The Apache license is probably the least ambiguous though. It's the longest. So people tend to choose the MIT cause it's the shortest. Um, so it's less to read. Um, but I think any of those three are, are viable and reasonable to use. Um, you know, that, I mean, the goal is you, you choose a license based on the behavior you want. Uh, the license that Dojo chooses is the BSD or the Apache 2. And we choose that to encourage adoption. We're not trying to control people and force them to contribute back. Obviously, if you have a bug fix, we'd prefer it become part of the framework rather than, you know, you having to maintain a forked version of Dojo forever. Um, but you know, like when you choose a, a license for your project, you very much need to 
decide what you want your project to be and and try to find a license that's going to lead you in that path. One thing that was pretty different when I started uh, working on or committing to foundation projects was the kind of a committer's agreement, um, which is separate from the usage license. Um, And I found that I think that's where a lot of open source projects don't have any uh, corollary to the foundation projects. And so I, I doubt it's even legal, but a lot of times in my like small open source projects, I'd say you can use this under the MIT license, but you uh, you can commit to it under the like Dojo uh, committers agreement or whatever. Can you explain more about that? So contributor license agreement is basically you've contributed some code and you're saying, I authored this or whoever paid for this to be authored approves of me contributing this code. And the idea is to make sure that we only accept code that we should accept. Now, it's not a legal guarantee that there'll never be a problem, but it's as close as we can get to saying, hey, we've vetted the source of this code and it's been contributed as it should be. Um, And so for years, actually, the Dojo Foundation said anyone could just follow the rules of the, the Dojo Foundation and contribute code even for their own project in that way. Um, The JS Foundation works a little differently in that it has basically a CLA bot that when you open a PR, if you haven't committed a PR to that project before, it makes you you sign a form real quick in the browser that says, hey, um, I know what I'm doing. I can contribute this code and I have the rights to um, to streamline the process. Um, But that also means it's kind of limited to the projects that are part of the foundation because it needs to hook into that system. Um, but again, like it's just having a CLA process that says, I agree that the code I can contribute is mine to contribute is um, you know, really important. Uh, yeah, I, I've definitely found that almost tends to be the place where I worry the most about, you know, getting getting code that looks good to me, but actually someone didn't have the rights to actually give it to me. And, and that can be scary. Absolutely. You know, just doing everything you can to make sure your users aren't going to be sued for using your project is a good thing. And a CLA is one part of that process where the the code you're accepting, the person who submitted it has at least declared they have the rights to do that is, is really powerful. Um, before I forget, I obviously forgot one foundation project, which is a big one for Dojo 2, which is Webpack, which I mentioned earlier. But um, obviously, Sean Larkin and their team are doing really great work on Webpack. And we've had a lot of success with that as well. I think Webpack certainly was not the front runner when it came out. There were a lot of competition at the time and then suddenly just took off, which is cool. We're talking about standards. We're talking about what standards are you excited about, either making it to browsers or becoming standardized? Uh, what's what's the cool new stuff? I mean, a lot of them, you know, we're pretty cautious in that we won't really embrace something until it's pretty far along. Um So, for example, we got burned a little bit on object.observer a few years ago, which reached level one, and we had kind of shimmed it and fixed everything we thought was broken with it to make it usable to then have it, you know, discontinued as a standard. So, in many ways, we look at things, but we don't really probably pay too much attention to them until they're, you know, the equivalent of stage three. Um, Obviously, we're pretty heavily aligned with TypeScript's feature set as well. And TypeScript's interesting because a lot of people will say, well, just wait for that to become part of you know, the TC39 process. And what a lot of people don't realize is TypeScript can kind of get away with adding features that are around you know, code integrity and authoring because they're all going to be removed at runtime anyway. So it, it's kind of liberating for them to not necessarily have to worry about the features that are going to go into the language, but that are more like developer time tool, language augmentation features. Um, so I don't know that we're like clamoring or waiting for any specific features at the moment so much as every time we see something cool, like we added resize observers just a few weeks before the final release because there was finally a a good shim for it and native support had finally landed in Chrome and we're like, well, we can take advantage of this now. Um, so it's kind of the, can you be nimble, but you don't want to be so nimble that you adopt things before they're ready, um, because then you're going to reduce you know, increase the risk of them being divergent from the standard itself. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I, I guess I was trying to get a little bit of your personal uh, excitement, but but no, I fine. I mean I have some, but I it's like I've been <laughs> I've um it's like I've had my heart broken so many times. I'm very cautious. <laughs> like we we have a shim for observables. You know, the the equivalent of like 
RxJS observables, but there's like one small tweak. And about two or three years ago, it was proposed as a TC39 standard. And as far as we can tell, it's stalled because it competes with streams, even though it's you know fundamentally a lot simpler to work with than streams. And so we have this sitting in Dojo Shim. Um, it's there. You could use it. But we've ended up not really using it ourselves. Instead, what we've done is the things that should be observable in Dojo 2 are just observable by default. Um, so we haven't actually ended up using the API much at all. But when we first thought it was going to be standardized, we had switched to having everything use it. And then it just kind of you know, took its toll. So it, it's kind of like we're very excited about a lot of the TC39 proposals around you know, additional async behaviors and around you know, adding features to the class system and, or, you know, trying to streamline the way classes work so they don't get abused and so forth. But until it's like right there, we're just very cautious because we don't want to get burned again. So Dylan, can you uh, enlighten us a little bit about what you see as the the future of, of Dojo 2? Now that we've got this, the second version release out the door, can you talk a little bit about where we go from here? Sure. So in many ways, getting the .o release done is kind of the point where you're like, okay, I think what I've got is good enough and substantial enough that people should start using it. But it doesn't mean it's complete. I would say Dojo 1 was probably four or five years from 1.0 until maybe 1.7 or 1.8, where it felt really complete from my perspective. So we have a lot we want to do around widgets. Um, We have features we want to add around... um, things to add feature parity with Dojo 1 even. I mean, Dojo 1 was so big that there are many things we just haven't tackled yet. Like, we haven't really started down the data grid path for Dojo 2 yet. Um, There's a lot of nice things we want to do around um, PWAs. We've done a lot of proof of concepts for that, but we don't yet have our PWA tooling in place that kind of makes your application automatically be a PWA. Um, There's a lot of patterns around data. So we have a an implementation called Dojo Stores that is your your sort of state management store. And it's a little bit, in my opinion, uh, easier to work with than something like Redux. But what we don't yet have are, are the sort of patterns of, hey, just hook this up to a RESTful endpoint or hook this up to a WebSocket and get data into my application. So some of those ease of use things. Um, I mean, there's just, there's a lot to do and we'd love contributions, but, you know, at the same time, if you wait till you have everything perfect, then you'll never ship. So you have to kind of say, okay, we've got enough that's substantial here. And now, now this opens the door for a whole bunch of other things. We want to get a nice design system done. Um, design systems are kind of a way to say, Hey, here's a set of consistent UI patterns and widgets and how they work together and how you use them. So just a lot of, a lot of things like that, really. Can I poke more around the PWA topic? Like what are just some, a couple of quick high level things that you're thinking about when it comes to PWAs? One of the goals of Dojo 2 in general is that we want to do things right out of the box. So for example, um, a couple features I haven't mentioned, I'll, I'll get to your question in a second, but let me set the preface for it, is things that are the right way should happen as automatically as possible. So for example, we have this build time rendering system that does code splitting and um, rendering optimization. So what it does is it essentially, uh, essentially delivers your initial view optimized as much as possible. So you know your HTML and CSS for your first view are, are rendered in line. Um, and you know the, the sort of code splitting happens automatically based on what features of your application you need at what point. Um, without you having to write different code to do that. So instead of saying, hey, how do we enable code splitting? We just do it for you. Um, Or instead of saying, how do we make that first paint as fast as possible? We just do that automatically out of the box. So the the same thing is true with a PWA. Instead of saying, hey, how do I make everything into a PWA? We say, okay, how do we set up, um, you know, your manifest file? How do we set up, you know, all the different features you might need to have an impressive, you know, PWA out of the box? and provide that as part of the build process so that every app you create with Dojo 2 would automatically be a PWA, would be the goal. Now, obviously, there's more you can do than that, but at least, you know, removing that sort of scaffolding boilerplate effort up front is a big win. So it's it's something we've done um, proof of concepts around and something we want to land fairly soon once we kind of sort out exactly how we want to do that. And the way that we actually do that is is kind of... um... I, I don't think we really mentioned it, but we have a robust set of CLI tools that help you get up and running 
with the Dojo project and sets up the build for you and does everything uh, for you so you don't have to mess around with a really complex Webpack config uh, or anything like that. You don't even have to, to realize that it's using Webpack and then you can um, build and serve your, your application in development and it'll automatically rebuild on, on every change and then also build for production from there. And so the, the PWA story kind of goes along with that with what can we provide from the CLI tooling to make it as simple as possible to take your app and convert it into a, a PWA or to deliver it as a PWA. That is very cool. I'm very excited to see the future of that as well. Um, so I want to take this moment to thank Dylan so much for coming on JS Party and sharing past, present, and futures of Dojo 2. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. So Jared dropped a wrap into the JS Party yes. Slack chat, and I see that that there's been some um, encouragement for me to do that wrap. So, all right, Jared, this one is for you. D to the illin, she to the man. Here comes that Dojo is going to make you a fan. Big version two, who saw it coming? Two years later, gonna get you up and running. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. See you next week. All right, thank you for tuning in to JS Party this week. Tune in live on Thursdays at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern at changelaw.com slash live. Join the community and Slack with us in real time during the shows. Head to changelaw.com slash community. And do us a favor, share this show with a friend. We just have a podcast. Go into Overcast and favorite it. And thank you to Fastly, our bandwidth partner. Head to Fastly.com to learn more. And we move fast to fix things right here at ChangeLog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. We're hosted on Leno Cloud Servers. Head to Leno.com slash ChangeLog. Check them out and support this show. Our music is produced by Breakmaster Cylinder. And you can find more shows just like this at ChangeLog.com. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week.